This is the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. Rule number one is you have to believe in yourself. You're the only one who doesn't think you belong in this appointment. The prospect has already validated your existence by scheduling time with you. Get it through your head you belong here, go in there, crush it, and close the deal. A place where sales professionals can come to learn from other sales professionals and thought leaders that have mastered their craft. The difference between a good salesperson and a best-in-class salesperson is only two minutes. By spending an extra two minutes on what you might think is a mundane task in the sales game, you separate yourselves from the pack, you grow your book of business, you close more deals, and you retain your accounts. As well as their peers who are still striving for perfection to achieve their why. I have a wife and four kids. Failure is not an option. Real sales professionals. Real stories. Real results. Are you ready to feel the power? Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Power Producers Podcast, where we are refining and redefining the sales game. And today, I am rolling sans beard again. This guy takes more vacations than Robin Leach, for crying out loud. I don't get it. He is not here again, but I have upgraded and brought in Mr. Justin Sloan from BSP Insurance and protege finalist from Meriden, Connecticut. And he's going to fill in Kyle's spot of asking questions. And today we have a great guest for everybody. We have Mr. Chris Craddock, who is an aficionado in real estate investment. He is the CEO of the Redux Group and the host of the Uncommon Real Estate Podcast. And we are going to get after it today. We're going to talk about all kinds of stuff in terms of scaling your business, leadership, and everything in between so chris welcome to power producers man happy to have you on thanks so much for having me here i'm I'm excited to spend some time with you boys sure thing man sure thing so listen um as we always do especially when it's somebody i don't you know know personally from our industry why don't you take a few seconds and just sort of go through and give everybody the ten thousand foot overview of kind of who you are what you're doing and how you got there yeah, sure. So I graduated college in 2000, um, went on staff with an organization called Young Life, loved it. It was amazing, changed my life. But then, uh, you know, a couple years later, my wife got pregnant and trying to live in the D.C. area on 20 to 25,000 a year doesn't really doesn't really work. And so went to the library, checked out every book I could find on real estate investing and um, ended up uh, in the next four months, uh, I flipped a bunch of houses, made 12 times what I made in a year in four months, um, allowed me to continue to um, do ministry stuff for a number of years. But I had more and more kids and anybody knows what it's like to have a bunch of kids. I've got six. Um, and so anybody knows that what it's like to have a bunch of kids knows that your money disappears really quick. And so literally like 2010, I was uh, you know doing ministry stuff, trying to like literally calling NIH to sell my blood for $300 to uh, buy Christmas presents for my family. And uh, I was just like, man, you know, I ended up starting to flip houses again. I'd gone back to school, gotten a doctorate in leadership, always led large pe- groups of people in ministry. And so I started uh, started flipping houses. I read Gary Keller's uh, Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, which was really interesting because it was a color by numbers way to build a a uh, real estate agent team that has a net profit of over a million dollars and uh, started building that out. And, you know, as, as that started growing, I just saw that there were other verticals within it, you know, title and lending and, you know, just, just construction, so many other verticals that we could start other uh, businesses and really work in it. And so that's where I am now. I've got 13 different verticals within the real estate space. Um, you know, my real estate agent team, uh, so we're, we're going to sell about 700 houses this year and, um, yeah, that's kind of the, the deal. So a few th- comments on all of that. Number one, big supporters of young life here, uh, in Tampa Bay financially contribute to them every single year. Um, as much as we possibly can. I was introduced to them by one of my clients who was, uh, the chairman of the board for the, <coughs> one of the local, uh, groups of them. And just what a great organization, man. Um, love yeah. to see the stories of the kids and everything we can do to help them uh, just means so much to us. 
I have four kids and can't even possibly imagine dealing with another two, even though I would have probably never stopped. My wife cut me off at four in as is typically the case. She knows better than I do. <laughs> so we're in a real good spot. We've got the, we got the management of four kids and two golden retrievers dialed in pretty good, but you know, it's well, interesting. We, adopted, we did adopt our third one. So uh, we cheated a little bit. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Well, it's interesting to me because, you know, I talk to a lot of people, whether it's on the podcast or whether it's in, you know, my normal life where I'm out working with middle market clients as far as insurance and risk management needs. And it always amazes me how many people have hit the absolute low. Right. And then they figure out a way to strap their boots on push through and get to the point where they they reach the success that they were always destined for but what i really appreciate is when they actually share the story of how they got to where they're at anybody can look at a you know a marketing slick or you know the cover of a book that somebody wrote or get up you know listen to somebody get up and deliver a keynote and talk about all the great things that are happening in their life but to me there's always a disconnect if you're not open and honest to talk about all the things you overcame to get there. That's really where the meat of it is. And, you know, I talk about it when I get up and speak. Um, you know, I remember the days when I would hear a beep, 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 and it's the garbage truck backing up to get the can in front of the driveway. And I was worried that it was a tro tow truck getting ready to hook the front of my car up and haul it off, man, because I've been there before. And so I think that, that it's good to be vulnerable like that. It, it, and I've got, you know, Justin and I have a friend that is well known for selling plasma to <laughs> bridge the gap, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, to before he, he his company took off. But I look at those things and I mean, when you can be vulnerable and you can share that part of your story, to me, that makes the success that much more powerful and it makes it more, it makes it appear more attainable for the people who are listening to this that maybe haven't hit that upswing yet. They're either in the dip or on their way into the dip and they don't know how they're going to come out on the other side. So my question to you after a very long setup is, you know, when you left Young Life and you got to the point where you were selling, you know, blood for Christmas gifts, I mean, my gosh, been there, done that, you know, what was running through your head? What was the mental focus? What were you clinging to at that time that had you believe, hey, I, I can build this unbelievably successful real estate firm that's moving multi-million dollars worth of, of deals every single year? What were you clinging to at that time? Oh man. Well, it's, I, like I've always been a big dreamer and been, and, and thought big, but I should warn you, man, we're going to start off with the soft questions first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but see, here's, here's the whole thing is like, I've got lots of friends that have big dreams. Um, but I think one of the differences is like, I'm okay with massive and perfect action. Right. And so like, just like when I went out to flip those houses, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I literally, didn't know it when I, the first time somebody said yes, I was like, oh crap, now what do I do? I don't, I don't have a contract. I don't have like, I have no way to like figure it out. And so then I had to figure it out. And that goes back to, you know, what I've heard Tony Robbins say just so many times that we never fail from lack of resources. It's always lack of resourcefulness. And so that's that whole idea was, I just was like, I'm just going to go figure it out. And um, there's been some times where it's been rough and I've been down and, and it's been hard. But the one thing that I've always, uh, always clung to is just that the idea that I'll figure, figure it out. I mean, I remember when COVID hit at that point, you know, I have over $150,000 every month that goes out, whether I sell a house or not. And, um, you know, I, I've got a lot of equity in a lot of my houses. I don't keep massive amounts of cash, right? Like I, 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 I feel like if you keep cash, it's just, it's not a good place to be, but I do keep enough to have a, you know, you know, anything goes wrong, a rainy day fund. And so, um, I started thinking about it and I'm like, dang, 150 K goes out every month. You know, I've got, you know, four or five months, but if we literally are locked down for like a long time, you know, what happens after that? Like, will I be, uh, able to even sell my houses that have equity in them? Would I be able to sell my assets to, to 
do what I need to do. And I, I still remember when, uh, the, cause I didn't think COVID was a thing. I don't know about you guys. Like I like, I just kept hearing all these things. I'm like, oh, whatever, whatever, whatever. And my wife's like, Chris, we are literally getting locked down tomorrow. Like we are literally lo- like, like nobody's going to be allowed to leave their houses tomorrow. And, uh, and I looked and I was like, oh crap. And the cool thing was during that time, I was able to remember all of these other times where things were hard and, you know, and I'm still standing and it, it, it created the person that I am today. Right. And so that was, that was kind of the, the piece there that I look at is, um, you know, we're, we're here today and we're the people we are today because we got beat up a little bit and you know, you break a bone and it grows back stronger. Right. So that's kind of that idea. You know, you go to the gym, you know, you get sore because you tear muscles down and then they grow back stronger. And so that's kind of what, what has brought me here today. So like every time tough things happen, I know that, you know, this is, this is where, where I need to be. And I'm able to just kind of push through it. I don't know if that makes sense or if I answered your question well or not. No, no, you did. I mean, you know, I've, I've been there before. I'm, I'm really of the mindset that I'm going to figure out a way to get things done. Right. So that's kind of paraphrasing what you just said, but I've never been afraid to take the risk. And I think that part of the reason that I've been somewhat successful is because I've never been afraid to take the risk. Right. I'm not going to miss an opportunity. Like it, it is really, really hard for something to be in front of me. That's a good opportunity. And me not, me not seize it. Why? Well, because I seize eight bad opportunities with every two good ones that I, that I seize, but the two good ones always make up for whatever the bad ones are. And over the time, as I've gotten more tempered, I also know when to cut bait and not hold on to something and try and force something to work. That's not going to work. So, you know, to that end, I'm really very, very similar in my thought process in that, you know, the, the one thing I look at is the fact I got, four helpless kids who need me to be able to be successful to take care of them. And that's, that's really what my motivator is more than anything else. But, you know, Justin, you went through a rough patch too, when you had your car wreck. Talk about that a little bit. Yeah. Back in 2012, I had a near fatal car accident. And, um, that's kind of why I was a little curious, Chris, like what was that tipping point? Um, because for me, you know, I was making six figures, I had benefits, I had everything going for me, beautiful house, everything. And once that car accident hit, um, you know, I was working, you know, punching the clock eight to five and and working for the man. And that was like that turning point for me where I was like, man, you know, I'm 26 years old. What am, what am I doing? Is this something that I want to continue to do until I'm 65? And, you know, if my 401k, hopefully it has some money in it. Um, and that was the turning point for me. And I, that kind of brought me to, you know, where we are um, in this conversation. I think, Chris, you know, what are some of the biggest challenges that you guys are experiencing um, when you're purchasing, flipping properties? I'm always curious, you know, working with my real estate investors, you know, once COVID hit, that kind of exasperated everything. We started to see scared money go to the sidelines. We saw some of the bigger investors really jump in. Um, I'm seeing a lot of the returns and the yields, um, you know, drop down because people are overpaying um, for properties. So, you know, what are some of the challenges you guys are experiencing now? Um, I know COVID's still a thing. It seems to be hopefully starting to fade a little bit. Um, you know, what are you guys seeing out in the marketplace, Chris? Yeah. I mean, the market's going up like crazy and is going to, I think it's going to continue to go up like crazy for a long time because of what happened with inflation. Real estate is one of the best hedges against inflation, real estate, gold, silver, and probably even cryptocurrency. And so, um, we're seeing, I mean, all the economic indicators, I think there's four or five different things out there that tell us that the market is going to continue to go up. And so, so for investors, I mean, there is a little bit of, uh, nervousness. Are we, are we at a bubble? You know, are we going to, are we at a tipping point? I mean, heck, if we get into world war three, you know, like, I mean, mm-hmm. all bets are off. We don't know what happens tomorrow. Right. So mm-hmm. the, the reality is, Um, What happens with everything? I I think the market is strong and solid. And I think that anybody that wants to be in the real estate market, the cool thing is, so when the market's really soft for investors, that's when investors can make a ton of money because houses that are not completely fixed up have to be given away. In a market like this, you could put dog crap on the MLS and you'll probably get three offers, right? Like that's where it is. No, you really can. I mean, we were going through this, man. We were ready to pull the trigger on a place in Key West and it was literally right at the time when things like this last year, it spiked crazily, it, you know, from a, from a layperson's viewpoint, 
it is spiked crazily. And, you know, you can't get a house there for under a million dollars. So, you know, we were talking about a significant chunk of change we want to invest. Well, the problem is that you're getting people who are coming in, making cash offers, over asking, sight unseen, as is. I'm not going to compete with that, right? There's just, it, I, I can't compete with that. I don't have those kind of resources. And, you know, my whole thing is I don't have a problem buying something as is, but I want to know what as is really is. What am I getting into, you know? And don't, no such thing as getting an inspection, right? If, if I ask for that, no, I've got three other people who have given me cash offers over asking and I don't have to head, have the headache. I can just take a deal with one of them. Well, here's what I know. 100% of the houses on the market down there or any property that you want to buy down there needs work. It has to have work. Mm. I just need to know what the scope of that is before I make an educated offer. And I finally decided, you know what? This is not the time for us to enter the secondary home market in Key West. I'm going to wait a little bit and see what happens because, you know, I don't I just don't know how it can maintain the pace and the velocity that it has right now. At some point, it's got to it's got to hit right. It's, it's got to hit a ceiling. Well, that's what they say. But like I, I would push back just a little bit on that. I mean, you know, if you know, you say you're in Tampa right now. Right. So. Yep. Like if you look at the real estate market in the country right now, allegedly. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, I, everybody wants to go down to Florida. My, uh, my brother-in-law and sister, are, like they're Jags in the, in the Navy or he's a Jag in the Navy and, uh, they're in, in Jacksonville. Like everybody's going to Florida. Um, uh, but, uh, but with that, I'll just say, if you look at the Tampa market 20, 30 years ago, I, be, I, I, and you, if you were to tell them that the houses would cost what your house costs today, people would say you're insane. They'd say you're crazy. You know, I look back at my, uh, my grandfather post World War II, he bought his house in a place called North Arlington, which is right outside the DC area where we live. Mm -hmm. It's one of the higher end areas where we are. And he bought his house for, I think it was, eight, it was either six or eight thousand dollars. And I, and when my grandmother passed a few years ago, I remember they were talking through the story where he was flipping out, just saying. The bubble's going to burst. The market can't sustain these prices. There's no way. And, and, and you know, heck, I look at my house, right? So I'm building a house uh, down the road from here. But the house that I live in right now, I bought it in 2006 for six ninety. dollars This house um, dropped in value about $140,000 in, you know, in less than a year. And now I just got a HELOC uh, on a home equity line of credit on my house here um, because we put a 15 year note on it and it's, you know, almost paid off the cool thing there. But, uh, but I looked, we bought before the biggest crash in a generation, like the biggest crash. And right now it's, it's probably worth about a million bucks. Like it's, it's just crazy. It's crazy that, that that's where we are. So my whole point is like, you never see a grandfather say, man, I'm glad I sold that house 40 years ago. Like it just doesn't happen. Right. And so I, I think, I think getting into real estate is just the best place to, to put your money in, especially if you can do stuff like Airbnb, short-term rentals, other things where you can go enjoy it, but then also have it paid for where you're not having long-term mm -hmm. rentals. Man, those are powerful, <clears throat> powerful places to put your money. Yeah, no, I agree. I think one of the things too is people don't realize, they don't think through it, I would say. I shouldn't say they don't realize it. But, you know, when you're, when you're, if you're holding on to a bunch of cash, what are you really doing with it, right? Like, how much are you really going to get a return on that? When you invest that same cash and put it into real property, real estate or otherwise, you're not getting, you're not losing that money. <laughs> you're just transferring mm -hmm. one asset class to a different asset class on the same balance sheet. You don't affect your net worth negatively per se. Now, granted, if the market fluctuates, I understand that, but I've never been scared of making an investment in real estate because if you look at the, you know, I think we've probably all seen those those graphs, the 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 line graphs that go up and, you know, they, they do the, um, they'll hone in and show like the market crash like this, right? But then when they, they zoom out, it really is only about that big, right? In the grand mm -hmm. scheme of 100 years, that, that <clears throat> massive dip that we saw really isn't that massive when you look at where it was in 1900 and where it is in 2000, right? So right. to me, real estate has to be, you know, outside of just putting your money into a bank at a half percent interest that they're going to insure up to what, $500,000. Real estate's a safe investment. It, it really is. I think that what happens is, 
I would be interested in your take on this, but you know, I think where people run into problems with real estate is when they watch too much HGTV, right? And they think they can yeah. do it, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. TV has sensationalized something that does require some level of expertise. And I, you, I mean, self admittedly, when when you got into it, you said I didn't know what I was doing. I had to figure out how I was going to get it done. Now, now with all of the content out there to consume. And the ease with which these people make it look like they're flipping these properties, I think that the average person is more apt to take a stab at it and probably gets burnt in the process because they don't really realize what they're getting into. Yeah, no doubt. And and see, I look at I look at real estate and real estate is kind of the every man's game. And that's what I love about it is like we've all played Monopoly. We know that you win. You never win in Monopoly if you just you just keep your cash and don't buy properties you land on, right? You've got to buy those properties. You and then you turn those little green ones into the the red ones. That's how you win, right? And so real estate to me, um, if you just keep your cash, not only are you keeping it in a bank account, like you said, but here's the thing: our cash is a melting ice cube right now, right? If the government tells us we had seven percent inflation last year, I don't believe that for one second. It was definitely double digits. I mean, the dollar store is the dollar twenty-five store for Pete's sake, right? <laughs> there is no way that it was just seven percent inflation. But like, just think about that. Let's say you had a hundred dollars in the bank, right? It is now they gave you you know, half a percent of interest. So that becomes a hundred dollars and what, like, and half a cent, whatever, whatever it is. Right. Um, and then, uh, but inflation takes it down to 93 cents is what you're looking at, but it's probably double digits. I mean, it's probably about 15%. So that dollar you had in the bank or the hundred dollars you had in the bank is now worth $85, right? Like that's, that's your now per new purchasing power. And so you look at that versus you look at real estate and, I mean, I had a buddy of mine who was like, hey, um, he wanted to buy two years ago. And then he was like, you know, the market's a little hot. I'm going to wait. And he was, you know, he was buying at a higher end, like around the 900 range. And he's like, ah, the market's, the market's a little rough. I'm, I'm going to wait. And so then he, uh, he waited. He called me the next, uh, like the middle of last year. And he was like, hey, Chris, by me waiting, it probably cost me 150 grand, didn't it? And I was like, Yep. But then the crazy thing is he got in and even over the last 12 months, he, he's probably got another hundred thousand dollars in equity that he got when he got in. So real estate, I think is a big win for a couple of reasons. One, you get leveraged appreciation, right? Um, like you get 10% of $10,000 in the stock market, you make a thousand bucks. If you buy a house with $10,000 and you buy a hundred thousand dollar house, and again, almost all houses are worth more than that, but let, let's just work with my terrible math, a hundred thousand dollar house. And he goes up 10%. You've got, you made 10 grand. You made a hundred percent cash on cash return, right? Then you also, when that money goes up, you're not paying taxes on it. So you save money in your taxes, right? Um, then if you want to rent it, you, you can rent it. You can pay you. You'll pay down your interest. Plus if you, there's a website, uh, bankrate.com mortgage interest deduction calculator. If you just type in, uh, your amount there, it'll tell you how much you're, you know, how much you save in taxes by being a homeowner versus renting. I mean, it's, it's just a no, owning real estate's a no brainer in my opinion. And as you can tell, I'm a little bit passionate about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I really wish you'd had some coffee this morning or something. Yeah. <laughs> well, let me ask you this, man. Um, how do you go about creating that relationship? So when, I mean, I don't understand enough about how you guys do what you do. I watch too much HGTV, right? I just have the discipline to not try and do it. But when you're going out and looking at properties as an investor or as an agent, are you looking for investors to partner with so that you guys can sort of build a dream team of people who are you know, constantly hunting and, and, and looking for properties to be bought and then supply that to a group of investors or an, you know, an investor that they work with or whatever? What, what does that look like? Or do you just do everything yourself? Yeah, you know, so, so it's a little bit of both, right? So when you are, if you are looking to buy properties, you win when you buy, always, always, always. You win when you buy. That's every so ounce of real estate advice I've ever gotten is you make your money when you buy, not when you sell. That's it, that's it. And if, if like we're on a big wave right now, but if we're buying to catch the wave, then that's just not not right, right? You win when you buy, right? And so, so like I've got this iPhone right here. I probably could sell it 
I don't know, maybe a thousand bucks. But if I were to offer you guys, um, if I were to say, hey, you guys wanna buy this phone for a for hundred bucks, you know, 50 bucks, would you buy it? Probably, right? Like, like 50 bucks, I, literally I can just put it on Amazon or eBay tomorrow for a thousand bucks. Yeah, like, like that, like I, almost everybody that I know would say, yeah, I'll buy it for 50 bucks, sure. Because they know they have something worth something more. And so that's the same thing with real estate is if, if you wanna be an investor, you either need to, need to be able to find the phone for 50 bucks because you guys have phones. You don't need my phone right there, but you know you can, like, dang, I can just literally put it on for, for that. You know, if, is there anything wrong with it? Like, what's, why would you sell it for that much? But maybe I need 50 bucks for whatever the reason is, right? And so if we can find people that uh, wanna sell at a discount, wanna sell under market for whatever reason, and I can tell you about 10 different reasons that I've seen people selling under market. Um, there's, there's six for sure that I know of, uh, but um, I've personally seen a bunch of them. But if you find those people that wanna sell under market so they can sell quickly or with convenience or whatever the reason is, um, then then you can make a lot of money right there. And, and for me personally, I come across stuff like, like right now, there's a couple, couple deals, I'm in the DC area, a couple deals in Baltimore. Baltimore's a little further than I wanna go, um, but there's a couple great deals there. So I've just got investors I call and work as an agent with them and just say, hey, you know, you, you interested in this, here's, here's where it's at. And one of them, the guy's like, yeah, this is great. So he's, he's about to lock it up. So, so stuff like that happens. So if you wanna get into investing, you either need to know how to go directly to the seller or you need to find somebody that does know how to go directly to the seller. And so that's one of the ways that our real estate agent business really, really started uh, taking off is because we could find deals. So everybody's like, well, dang, I, I can't find deals. I mean, heck, I even have other real estate agents that are my investors, right? Because they, they got their real estate agent license thinking that they'd be able to find deals if they, if they were an agent and then they get in and they're like, I don't really have any, <laughs> any idea what I'm doing. And so, I mean, I literally get probably somewhere between 50 and $100,000 in commission every year from other agents that are asking me to find deals for them. It's crazy. Yeah. Hey, Chris, so to that point, uh, all of us being business owners here, I think it doesn't matter what industry you're in, especially right now. Um, I'm curious how you find and attract and retain, you know, top talent for your teams. I know you have a couple different businesses, um, but is there a kind of some secret sauce that you find helps you, you know, attract those people to your businesses? Um, and if so, you know, what does that look like? Man, this is one of my favorite things to talk about. So just cut me off anytime you if I'm going to <laughs> too much or getting too long winded. So first, um, there's a handful of books that I think everybody should read that wants to scale a business. One is called The E Myth. Two is EOS Traction. Three is Who Not How. Four is uh, Four uh, Four Disciplines of Execution. Five is Scrum. Six is Clockwork. Um, you know, all of these books are, are some of the best books out there. And I think anybody that's a business owner that wants to own a business and not just have a job, even if it's a high paying job, needs to read those books and really understand them. I spent almost a year just like rereading those books over and over and over again. And that was, that was when I was able to step out of my business, step out of the day to day and start really working on it and not working in the business. And so that's, that's a huge piece. Now, uh, retaining and, and attracting talent, you know, John Maxwell, um, you know, and Jim Collins both talk about like that, that level five leader, right? The, the leader that, that attracts other people. And so your business will grow to the extent that you grow any day of the week. And so if you are not, if, if I'm like a mid tier talent, then I'm going to attract like mid and low tier talent. If I'm a high tier talent, I can attract low, mid, and also high tier talent. And so one of the things that I do every single day is I work on leveling myself up. And so I spend about an hour a day on some sort of education every single day. I'm, I mean, just massively into Audible. I do podcasts. I, I do a lot of these different things where I can get mentored by people that are so much smarter than me, like so much better in those areas um, in life. And so so I'm always leveling up. And I think about this every morning. I know that if I don't level up, that the high talent people in my world, every time, I'm just telling you, every time high talent people in your world leave your world, it's because you have not created a world, and, and I know everybody's gonna give me other reasons and whatever, you have not created a world that's big enough 
for them to live within that world and not outgrow you, right? And that's that's always the reason. And everybody, somebody's gonna tell you, Chris, you're you're an idiot for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. But I'll tell you what, if you can grow your world big enough so that they can grow with you and hit every dream they want, man, that's when you win. You know, Zig Ziglar's whole thing, you can have everything you want in life if you help enough other people get what they want in life. And so if your world can help them accomplish all the goals and dreams that they have, and so that then you win together, then that's the way to do it. But if you're not looking at that and allowing high talent people to continue to grow without hitting the glass ceiling, which is you and me, then they're going to leave us. That's great. Those are good books, by the way. I've read about half of them. I was so. going to say, man, <laughs> I got <laughs> definitely read traction. We're act actually mm -hmm. implementing EOS in the agency right now. I mean, so and here's the thing, man. Th this is my opinion on all of this stuff. Are these people uber smart? Yeah, they're, they're they're intellectual people, but they're not any really any different. They just look at things differently than what the status quo looks at things. And by immersing yourself in reading or listening to audio books or podcasts or whatever else, what you're doing is exposing yourself to the thought processes of successful people, right? And I tell people this all the time. You want to be a millionaire? Go read The Millionaire Mind. Go read The Millionaire Next Door. Those aren't novels. Those are instruction manuals, you know? <laughs> like, if you want to understand why millionaires are millionaires, read that book. It'll tell you. You can understand their spending habits. You can understand why their average home is only $270,000 worth of value with no mortgage, but they live where they live because of low taxes and great school systems. They drive used cars. You know, the number one dr most driven car by a millionaire is a Toyota Camry, and number two is an F-150. You know, they buy cars that are two or three years old, let somebody else take the depreciation off of it, go out, pay cash. They don't have a car payment either. And then they just continue to have this money come into their budget that many of us that have some level of debt, whether it be a mortgage or a car payment or whatever else, we're having to turn around and then hand that money to other people. They're just amassing wealth, deploying it to another area of their balance sheet and just getting richer and richer by the day. The problem that we have is society paints a picture of rich people as being those people that are either professional athletes or, you know, your people that are in Hollywood. And it's funny because when when Tom Stanley wrote his last book before he passed away, it was called Stop Pretending You're Rich and Live Like a Real Millionaire. And he in that book, he defined the difference between people who are balance sheet rich, which is ultimately wealthy people and people who are income statement rich which are people who have really good salaries, but no discipline after the money rolls in. So they're never going to accumulate wealth. It's leaving just as fast as it comes in. Look at how many people retire from professional sports. Although I would argue very few of them are baseball players, but the people that, you know, the football players, NBA players, and they're bankrupt within a couple of years of retiring because they mm -hmm. never knew what to do with their money. Same thing holds true with these lottery tickets. You know, the lottery winners, right? You give somebody who has no ability to manage money, you know, $10 million or whatever it is, they're just going to mismanage $10 million. Yeah. They're play the same game with bigger stakes, right? So, you know, I think it's, it's really prudent advice to take that time to invest in yourself to make yourself smarter and better on a daily basis and you know not everybody out there might have an hour but when we had my friend daniel song on the podcast we talked about reading literally 10 pages a day that's it just read read 10 pages a day if you read 10 pages a day you're reading th uh, 300 pages a month which is essentially a book that's 12 books a year not very many people out there reading 12 books a year right now but when you break it down in you know another great book is atomic habits by james cleary when you break mm -hmm. it down into the atomic habit now all of a sudden you're achieving those things right 100 mm -hmm. percent. yeah i mean and that's that's it. I mean, people don't realize that that they are the bottleneck in their life. And and you know, like like take ownership of your life, right? Realize that if you are not a, accomplishing the dreams that you have, I promise you, every single every single one of us, there is somebody way dumber than us that is way more successful in our business because they're just doing the right things, right? And so it's not about being smart or dumb or anything else like that. It's, it's about doing the right things, being people of action. It's activity and skill, right? Like if you can get those two things going, you're gonna, you're gonna win. And so that's, 
that's pretty much it. I mean, heck, you know, look at McDonald's, right? McDonald's has a billion dollar organization built on the back of 16 year olds that don't have high school degrees, right? Because a number one is a number one, whether you're in Virginia or California or somewhere in between, you know, the number one is a number one and this is how you do it. Yep. Now it, it's interesting uh, when you see companies like McDonald's, you're right. Like that entire company is running on the backs of essentially teenagers or, or in today's day and age, whoever's willing to go work for what they're paying. I mean, I never thought I would see the day McDonald's is hiring people in at 15, 16, $17 an hour to flip burgers, but that's what they're getting right now. You know, it's, it's just, it, it's insane to see how much everything has changed in the world just due to the existence of COVID. Let's switch gears yes. for a minute, man. You are the host of the Uncommon Real Estate Podcast. You said that you listen to podcasts. You listen to audio books. What do you talk about on your podcast, and what was what was your uh, motivation for starting it? Yeah, so my podcast, it's called Uncommon Real Estate, and I know the average podcast listener listens to seven podcasts, so I would love if you guys keep listening to this and want to join, join ours. But here's, here's the average person that listens to our podcast is they're a real estate agent or investor and uh, a real estate agent that also wants to be an investor. And I think that that's where the world is going is that it's becoming agent investors that they're, it used to be these two separate worlds and now they need to come together. Um, the biggest problem that I have with real estate agents is they don't buy their own product. Like they, <laughs> they literally are helping everybody else get wealthy, but they just have a job, right? And so what you were saying, David, earlier was, um, was that uh you know that that's the problem you know net sheet versus balance sheet like versus like income right and so the definition of wealth in my opinion is when your money uh works harder than you work and so that's that whole idea of real estate agents even if you're making you know 500 a million 1.5 million dollars a year even if you're making big money it doesn't really matter um, if you stop working or you go on vacation and your income goes on vacation, you've got to learn how to build wealth and wealth is when your army of money is out there, you know, winning for you and you're not actually having to do the heavy lifting to make that happen. And so that's what we talk about on our podcast, how to, um, how to become an agent and an investor. Got it. Justin, what are we missing, man? You're you're the guy with the real estate investment roots. You got yeah, a guy on here I that's think, living in that world every day. Ask him whatever you want. Yeah, this is true. I think the biggest thing, and um, especially being you're talking about uh, real estate agents trying to get into investing, I think one of the biggest thing that we're seeing on our side um, is a lot of hand holding with the newer people and investors. And and one of the common questions I get asked, and I know some of them watch podcasts that I'm on, so I'm sure they'll watch this is, you know, how do you budget for surprise expenses? Um, a lot of, it sounds like you're investing in multiple states. I'm assuming you're not flying all over the place, checking out every single property. Maybe you do have some boots on the ground. Um, but you know, some of these things like David was saying, when he's buying a property in Key West, uh, people are buying these as is and they get in there and it's like, you know, oh, geez, we need to do all new mechanicals. The roof's actually way worse than it was. You know, this load bearing wall might, you know, might not be uh, have another five years in it. You know, how are you budgeting for that? Um, what type of surprise expenses have you seen in the past? I know you've probably got burned on some deals and stuff like that. And I guess how do you um, do better going forward to, you know, alleviate those types of issues? Yeah, I mean, one, never trust anybody that doesn't walk with a limp. If you've never been burned before, then there's somebody that just hasn't been in it long enough, right? And so um, so that's that's the deal. There, there will be surprise issues. It just depends on the deal that you're looking for. Are you looking for a property for yourself? So like David was talking about a Key West property that his, him and his family would enjoy. You know, my the lake house we bought last year, um, you know, we bought as is knowing that if there were problems, which there were, um, you know, it, it, it's less about the return on that and more about the enjoyment of it. Now, if you're looking for just a return, then, you know, you're you're probably looking it's, it's a different search, right? You're, you've got a different search, right? So if you're just looking, if it's just dollars and cents and not the enjoyment of the of the property, then you've got to you've got to have massive margin, right? And you've either got to have a real estate agent that's really incredible, or you've got to know how to go directly to seller. And like one of the easy ways to do that, you know, batch 
batch leads, right? They, they make it simple to go to directly to seller. I've got a, uh, a promo code where they give everything half off, you know, uncommon. Use that code and um, you can go directly to sellers, people that are likely to sell under market or something called driving for dollars. Deal Machine has something where you can just drive through neighborhoods, look for properties that are under market, that look, that look just beat up or dilapidated and just on the map function, you just click, 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 click. You, you get 100, you find 150 of those and then literally just hit a button and it'll give you all the data. You could call, you could text, you could send flyers to them. Um, and again, if you use the code uncommon, um, they'll give everything to you, I think at like half off. Um, so it's it's really, really cool there. But if you go directly to seller, um, that's how you get really, really great deals. But if you're looking in a specific place, like if I say, hey, I need to buy in Key West for me and my family, I'm gonna want something a little bit more special. And if you want something that's more special, then you're gonna to have to pay closer to market value. But you know what, if you're gonna hold on to it for 10 years, 20 years, whatever, then some things that go wrong, you know, at, I remember I was in uh, Gary Keller's uh, small group of top agents when I was at Keller Williams. Um, and I, I'll never forget him saying this. He's like, hey guys, you wanna know the difference between the idiots and the geniuses in real estate? And I'm like, oh man, billionaire, one of the smartest guys in all of real estate. What is he going to tell us is like this, the key differentiating factor. And he was like, how long you hold it? <laughs> I was like, okay, all right, that makes sense. You know, that's the difference between the idiot and the genius. I bought it, you know, 40 years ago. Now I'm a genius. So um, that's, that's the whole thing. I, I mean, I bought my house at the top of the market and now it's worth, it's not quite double, but it'll be worth double here shortly. Um, and you know somebody will look back and say, "Oh, you were a genius to buy when you bought." <laughs> you know, but little do they know it was the top of the market. Yeah. So kind of to that point, um, you know, we were talking about uh, real estate agents dabbling into real estate investing, stuff like that. Do you have any tips for them? Um, a lot of the newbies, you know, like you said, you kind of just stumble into it, and you're like, "Oh crap!" Now I gotta figure out how to put this deal together. Is there any words of wisdom, whether they are an existing real estate agent or maybe the, you know, like David was saying, HDTV person watching it, um, any words of wisdom getting into it? Yeah, one of my buddies that is actually on one of those shows and it's so funny because it's all just, it's bogus. It, like all of that stuff is so bogus. The reality is if you wanna win, um, you've gotta go direct to seller or you have to have somebody that, that knows how to go direct to seller. and and pay them well. If you have a real estate agent, if you're a real estate agent, pay another real estate agent. Don't, like I have done it. I've had, I have agents that come to me and bring me deals too. Like, you know, usually it's like one-offs here and there because the ones that do a lot of it, anyway, but bottom line is pay them. Don't, don't try to, you know, scrimp and save over a couple bucks if they're bringing you a deal that has a big margin. So that's one of the big deals. Number two, um, look to go directly to the seller, right? Like find stuff, like use the batch stuff, use the driving for dollars. Um, there's a ton of other resources out there as well, but those are the easiest ones to go directly to sellers. Um, and they'll, uh, you know, that, that's how you find the great deals. And then if you're a real estate agent, if you don't find the deal, then you can also list the property as well. So you can, you know, that's, that's the best part there is if you can have two exit strategies on every deal that you come across, that's, that's how you can really win. Yeah. Thanks for that, Chris. Yeah. 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 What have we missed, man? I mean, I feel like we've covered a lot, Chris. What have we missed that you want to get out there to everybody? Well, the last thing I'll just say is, um, you know, I, I do think that there's there's a lot of power in hiring coaches. Like who you walk with will definitely dictate your future. Um, so for me, I remember the first time I hired a coach, I, I just couldn't even believe I was spending that money. My wife hated the idea that I was spending the money, but then, I mean, it changed my life. It was it was incredible. And now I'm at a place where I spend over six figures a year on coaches and masterminds and everything else. I think that that is something that everybody should be looking at because they're going to help you compress decades of learning into days, right? They're going to help you get, get where you want to go faster. And here's the deal. Everybody listening, you're probably smart people. You're probably good at doing what you do. But... Um, but the reality is you can figure out how to get there. But let's say it takes you a year, two years, five years. Um, I, I'm curious, Justin and David, if you guys could go back five years from now or five years ago and know everything you know about business, life, everything else today, and you could take a pill 
that would take you like so that you were five years ago and you know everything you know right now, what would you pay for that pill? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I'm going to answer this as if that question is rhetorical, but I mean, I'd pay whatever I needed to pay. I mean, that I understand the net present value of money, right? And if I can if I can pay a little bit of money to get from point A to point B faster so that now I'm making more money that I've arrived at point B, I'm going to f- much quick I, I will outpace my earnings in a 10 year spread if I use the fast forward button. Right. I mean, it's just inevitable for that to happen. And it's interesting because we have a lot of that that happens in the in the insurance industry, too. I mean, there are some really really exclusive high-end masterminds where you're talking about going and paying you know 25 or 50 grand a year to be part of this group and people in our industry i'll go ahead and call it like i see it they're notoriously cheap right everything's viewed as an expense it's rarely viewed as an investment difference being in the investment you get a return and an expense that's just money you spent because it was part of the budget and it goes away but you know, at the end of the day, I, I've really had my mind opened a lot to just these different high end mastermind groups and the value that they bring. And I see them in real estate, I see it both on the investment side as well as the agent side. I see it in, in insurance. I see it for digital marketing. There are some really high powered masterminds for digital marketing. And it's not cheap to be part of it. But what I know is they don't just meet once in adjourn. Like they're sticking around. And in order to stick around, there has to be some level of value delivered. And those people have to be getting a multiple of that money that they invested back. I'm not going to spend 25 grand to join a mastermind and only get $5,000 out of it. But if you tell me that if, you know, that I have the ability to learn the, the tools I need to generate over $100,000 in revenue based off of that investment, I'm going to make that investment 10 out of 10 times. Because at that point, you're telling me you're giving me the information and it's up to me to execute that. And it's up to my work ethic to make sure that I execute that as flawlessly as I can. What I'm lacking in most cases is that higher level information that my experiences have not put me in front of yet. So if I have the ability to spend some money and do that, I mean, look, guys, I do. I do that. I I do that for other people right now. I have an online ecosystem where we train people how to move commercial insurance in the middle market and people pay a very healthy price tag to be part of that community. But guess what? They're fast forwarding their career. If they go through the program as we have designed it, they can go from zero to literally probably producing what somebody who's been in the industry five to seven years is producing because they don't have to take the time to make a bunch of mistakes to figure it out. I already made all the mistakes. I already paid all the stupid tax. I'm going to put it out there. You can follow my blueprint. And if it works for you, as long as you execute and you're not lazy, it's going to work for you. So anytime you tell me that you can get me in front of the people who can make me better, it's going to cost me money. But, I, but I'll make money as long as I execute and do my part. I'm going to bet on myself 10 out of 10 times. Yes, 100%. That's awesome. Good deal. So, Chris, you're a, you're a nationally certified life coach. Tell me, tell me a little bit about that. Uh, is that something you're still active in? And, um, you know, what is a life coach? I, I've heard of them, but I'm just curious. Yeah, so the interesting thing is I've never really done anything with my life coaching piece. Um, I got that when, uh, um, when I got my, like I went back, I got a doctorate in leadership. So when I was going back to school, like that was part of the, the doctoral process. Um, but yeah, you know, heck, I coached high school sports. I coached, you know, for what, 15 years. Um, I, you know, I'm coaching agents. I'm coaching people on my team. When I was in ministry, I was basically helping people be better, a better version of themselves. So that's pretty much what I do almost every day, all day is, is helping people be better. And so when I started our coaching business, um, a few years ago, I've got a coaching business, REI Revive, teaching investors how to work with agents or how to be agents and monetize leads when they go directly to seller. Um, you know, that that was one of those big, big keys there is just helping people make more money with what they're doing. Right. So that's mm-hmm. that was kind of the, the key there. Nice. Yeah. Good stuff. 
Good deal. So if somebody's listening and they want to get in touch with you, if they want to explore more about what you're doing, the education that you're putting out there, your coaching program, whatever, how do they find you, Chris? Hey, yeah. So the uh, the way to find me would be a couple places. One on uh, Instagram. So one of the things that I offer to do just because whenever I like somebody's vibe on podcasts, I would reach out to them. And so um, I'm personally responding to everybody. Sometimes I think I've got three I've still got to get to today. I was, I was way behind. But anybody that wants to send me a DM on Instagram, I'm happy to connect with you at Cradrock, C-R-A-D-D-R-O-C-K. Um, old cheesy high school nickname, not my last name. Um, also, we have an Uncommon Real Estate Facebook page for any agents that want to be investors as well. And then we, uh, um, you can also go to my webpage, chriscraddick.com. Awesome. Perfect. Well, listen, man, we're wrapping up on about an hour of being together. I want to be respectful of your time. I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to come on and chat with us. You know, I'm always excited to talk to successful people, whether they're inside my industry or not, because I think there's a lot of bleed over on those habits that make all of us better. So I just really appreciate your transparency and being willing to spend some time chatting with us today. And uh, look forward to continuing to watch you thrive and your success continue to build on itself, man. Well, thanks for having me. This has been a fun time together. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. Everybody else, we will catch you next time around. Reach out to Chris. He told you where to find him. If you want to get into real estate investment, few resources, if any, are better. Make sure you take advantage of the opportunity to pick his brain. Catch you next time. You've been listening to the Power Producers Podcast. You can follow Killing Commercial Insurance on Facebook and YouTube. And if you want to take your game to the next level, next level, check out our book, The Extra Two Minutes, and our website, killingcommercial.com. <laughs>